Welcome back to the winter term. Uh, this is SISC 220, the system level programming course. All right, so I'm just going to take care, today we're going to take care of the usual course administration. I'm going to tell you about the course, its policies, yada, yada, yada. Uh, and then I'm going to show you very quickly um, what we're going to do in the first part of the course, uh, which is a little bit different than what we do in the second part of the course, but I'll tell you about that shortly. Okay, so I'm Dr. Burton Ma. You've probably had me in 124. If not, hello. Uh, my office is in the seventh floor of Goodwin Hall, room 754. So you go up the elevator, turn left, go through the doors, turn right, uh, and then go down that hallway and you'll find me. Uh, I have office hours four days a week. So Monday through Thursday, 1.30 to 2.30. In person, you should be able to find me in my office. Um, you might be able to find me at other times. Um, in particular, slightly after 2.30, uh, but that's not guaranteed. I am teaching three courses this term, so there's a lot of teaching for me. Um, if I'm not around in Goodwin, I'm probably somewhere else on campus giving a lecture or doing a lab or something like that. Uh, every once in a while, there is a third, so once a month, the department has a meeting for faculty. It's also scheduled on Thursday. Uh, it's normally finished before well, it's probably not going to be finished before 1.30. I think it's supposed to finish at like 2 or something like that. So every fourth office hour might have to be canceled or moved. Um, but I'll let you know ahead of time and on on cue if that has to happen. Email. So please, if you email me, put sysc220 in the subject line. Because otherwise I don't know what you're talking about. Right? Uh, the vast majority of email I get are assignment to question or something like that. And I have no idea what course you're talking about. Uh, next, this term is particularly bad, I teach three courses. So if you send me something that says assignment three, question, uh, I'm going to be very annoyed because I, no, I have to parse your email and try to figure out what, you're, what it is you're talking about before I know which course uh, you're asking about. Okay, so make sure you put the uh, course code in the subject line, please. Uh, that's my email address if you need to use it. Uh, teaching assistants, so that information is on OnCue. There's, this is not a big class, so there's only two teaching assistants. Uh, each teaching assistant starting next week uh, will have an office hour, a virtual office hour on OnCue. Uh, that information will be on, uh, sorry, on Teams, it'll be on Teams. Uh, that information will be on OnCue, there'll be a link, you can subscribe, to the, uh, you can just click the link to go to their office hour uh, once a week. Right? Uh, so their office hours are virtual, mine or in person. Uh, all course information, I believe, is currently on OnCue. I think everything is up to date now. Uh, lectures I will record uh, and post uh, sometime after the lecture has occurred, um, depending on my schedule and my inclination to post the videos. It actually takes quite a lot of work to post the videos, so, um, uh, so if, if they show up late, uh, it's because I'm annoyed and I don't want to do it. <laughs> Sorry, that's just the way it is. Um, but I will try to post them uh, in a timely fashion. Last term was not terrible, but it wasn't great. Okay, textbooks. There is no required textbook for this course. Uh, there are a full set of working, Ju well, sorry. For the first part of the course, there's a full set of working Jupyter notebooks. I'll show you those shortly. For the second part of the course, uh, there is a almost complete set of working notebooks. And again, I'll show those to you towards the end of the lecture. There is another set of course notes written by Dr. David Lamb, who's another faculty in the department. Uh, you probably haven't dealt with him at all. Um, uh, you can hit that link and go to those course notes if you want to use those. Those are, that's just one big PDF document um, and it's very sparsely written, right? In other words, it's not really, um, what's the best way to put it? Uh, it's not really a complete textbook. He gives you information and that's basically it, right? So there's no, there's not a ton of explanation, there's no exercises or things like that. Uh, if you want, Reference books, there's a million of them, right? So there's lots and lots and lots and lots of online resources or textbooks that you could, excuse me, that you could use. Uh, so the first one there, uh, the Linux command line, um, everything in that, so if, if you were to read that book front to back, you would cover the entire half, first half of the course. The second book, if you were to read that book completely, you would cover the entire second half of the course and more. Right? Uh, those books are available to you freely online. Right? And again, there's lots and lots and lots of resources for, uh, for a course like this. Grading, uh, I guess I'll just show that to you now. 
Oh, sorry. Oh. Where is on cue? Is that on cue? That's not on cue. Where did on cue go? Oh, here. Okay. Uh, that's. Okay, so here's on cue for the course. <laughs> I have no internet access. Sorry, hang on. Uh, this is going to be, yeah. Oh, wait, that's why. Sorry. Uh, so do they make you change your password? Every, yeah. They made me change my password, and I didn't do it on this computer. Sorry. Give me a minute here. Oh, it's probably going to ask me for that stupid too fast. <sighs> Sorry. Now I'm going to have to dig out my phone, I bet. Oh, no, hey, all right. Let's try that. OK, there we go. Here's on cue. Uh, grading scheme. So if you go here, uh, the grading scheme is right there. So there's uh, six assignments. The first assignment uh, is smaller than the other five, so it's worth a little bit less. Uh, the first assignment is to basically make sure your computer is set up to do work in this course. Uh, and it's to get you using the command line, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, there are two quizzes uh, in class. Uh, those are the tentative dates. Uh, they're probably going to stay that for this course. They are in class, but I note that you have crappy desks to write on. Um, so I will try to schedule a different room at the same time for those classrooms so that you can actually write on something that's not a flimsy piece of particle wood. Okay, and then there's an exam. Uh, the exam is set by the exam office. Uh, quiz one covers the first part, well, not all of the first part of the course, so it covers bash. Quiz two is a little bit of bash plus C. The exam is strictly C. Okay. So the exam is not a comprehensive exam. It doesn't cover the entire course. Right? So part one of the course, well, most of part one of the course, then part of part two and the rest of part one of the course, and then the exam covers the rest of uh, part two of the course. Uh, this grading scheme worked out pretty well last term, so I think I'll keep, so I'm going to keep it for this term. Okay, assignments. So you have assignments. They're the usual computing science type of assignment that involves mostly programming. Uh, you submit them on OnCue. There's instructions for submitting them on OnCue every time, right? Uh, I'm using a universal accommodation policy this term for the first time for all assignments. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, there are students who have what are called academic accommodations. Um, some of those students get up to seven extra days if they need it to do assignments. Um, so in order to deal with everybody, try to deal with everybody fairly, what we're going to do this term is there's an official due date for all assignments. Right? So assignment one has an official due date. That is the expected due date. That's the date that I expect you to hand in the assignment. Right? Typically what happens is the next assignment rolls out shortly after the first, shortly after the previous assignment's due date, right? So even if you get extra time, you don't really want to spend that extra time on the previous assignment because you now have extra assignments coming in, right? So the expectation is you hand in the assignment on their official due date. Right? Now, everyone may submit up to three days late with no penalty. You do not email me. Do not email your TAs, right, to tell us it's late. I don't want to hear about it. Just submit it three days late. Don't worry about it. Okay? It will be marked. No penalty. Okay. Now, there are a very small number of students who may need extra time because they have a special accommodation with the university. If you need more than those three days, contact me. We will come to some other arrangement. If no one contacts me after the th uh, before the, uh, the three-day um, late, the three-day late, uh, uh, three days after the assignment is due, I will post the assignment solutions immediately. Right, uh, and then uh, you'll have access to the solutions as well. Any questions about that? All right, so everybody gets the three extra days, right? If you have an academic accommodation, you don't get the three days plus the accommodation, right? Uh, you get uh, whatever the you get whatever the accommodation says you get. Quizzes are in class. Uh, they're on paper, so not on computer, on uh, not by computer. Um, uh, there'll be examples of last term's quizzes posted on OnCue sometime before you actually have to write a quiz. Okay. And again, the exam is in person, also pen and paper, scheduled by the exam's office. 
uh, I think it's, it's not a three-hour exam because it doesn't cover the entire course. Uh, so I think last term it was two hours um, and a relatively short exam at that as well. Any questions so far? Yes. Yeah. What would you suggest be like the first point of reference? Is that your Jupyter notes? Or yeah. Like notebooks. Uh, yeah, the Jupyter notebooks first and foremost. Okay. Yeah. Uh, those two textbooks that are linked there that are on the library's website, those are actually quite good. Uh, a lot of the course material um, is not based on, but a lot of the course material is also referenced in those two textbooks, uh, those two books. Right. The C book in particular is quite good. Uh, the Bash book is very easy to read as well. All right, so what is this course about? So this is called a systems level programming course. Um, so the way, your, uh, the way your programming stream has worked, uh, you've basically been going backwards in time. So you started out with Python, which is a very high level, quite modern language. Right? So by high level, I mean the language does a lot for you that you don't actually see. It provides lots of facilities for you, right? Things like lists and all sorts of other data structures, they're all part of the standard library that comes with that language, right? Uh, and then we threw you into Java, right? And you probably noticed that Java also does a lot of stuff for you, but it doesn't quite do as much stuff that Python does for you, right? That's because Java is a slightly older language than Python. This course goes back even further now, right? So now you go back before Java, right? And you learn two different programming languages. One's called a shell scripting language, Bash. The other one is a uh, high level language called C. Now C is, the, uh, is often called the high level language that is the lowest level high level language. So it's the high level language uh, that does the least amount for you, the pro for the programmer, right? And so when you get to the C part of the course, you're going to very quickly realize, or hopefully you very quickly realize, uh, that stuff that Python and Java does for you automatically, C doesn't do for you at all, you have to do it yourself. Um, and there will be a lot of swearing and cursing at your computer when your programs don't work. Um, and that's just the way that C works. Right? Uh, Bash, is also, Bash is very different, so it's very different than the languages you've been learning so far. Uh, it's different because it's not meant to be a general purpose programming language. Right? So languages like Python and Java, you can write lots of different programs. Uh, in those languages, right? Not everything, like it, Python's not appropriate for say video games, right? Neither is Java really, right? Uh, but you can do lots of stuff with both languages, right? They're better at some things than others. Uh, Bash is not a general purpose programming language. It's meant to be a language that, uh, I guess, what's the best way to put it? That interacts with the operating system, sort of. Um, and in, so in that regard, it's quite a bit different than what you've been doing so far. It has all the usual, it has all the programming structures, well, not all, it has many of the programming structures that you're used to, right? If statements, conditionals, some arithmetic, uh, looping, but that's not really what the language was meant to do, right? And you'll see what I mean by that as we move through the course, right? So don't be surprised if the stuff that we're doing looks very foreign to you, because it probably is. All right, so, oh wait, sorry, oop, oop, oop. Uh, what do we got going on? Okay, so there are three main goals in this course. One of them is to learn a little bit about operating systems, right? You need this because eventually you have to take SIS324, the operating systems course. So rather than throw you in, not ever having, not even knowing what an operating system is before you get to the OS course, uh, it's good that you be introduced to some of the concepts now, right? Uh, we're gonna use Bash uh, as our main form of interacting with the operating system in this course. So that's the first part of the course. And then finally, we're gonna use C uh, to learn how to write, uh, I guess, general purpose, to use a general purpose programming language that runs at a lower level than the languages you've been using so far. You also need C because many of your upper year courses will do C++ or something, uh, or some variation of C. Um, uh, and so you need to know how to program, at least in basic C, before you get to those courses, right? Uh, the fact that you've taken, uh, has everybody taken 124? Is anybody not, is anybody taking 124 with this course, I guess? Okay. So that's, uh, you'll have a bit of a fun time in this course. Um, it's not too bad because everything you need for C, you learn in the first few weeks of this course. Uh, you'll learn in the first few weeks of 124. So that won't be a big deal. For those of you who have taken 124, good news is the syntax of C is very close to the basic syntax of Java. 
right? If statements, for loops, uh, variable declarations, they all behave exactly the same in the two languages. So you already know the uh, basics, many of the basics of the C programming language. It's all the other stuff that you don't know uh, that's going to cause problems. All right, so what's an operating system? So most of you, you've all used a computer, right? You all interact with your computer. When you interact with the computer, uh, you're interacting with uh, some part of the operating system, right? So in Windows or in Mac OS, you move your mouse around, you click on stuff. Right? You're interacting with the operating system in some way. In this course, you're going to interact with the operating system in a completely different way. Right? So your operating system is this blue block here. Right? It's the software that sits between your hardware and whatever program it is you're using. Right? So whenever you use a program like, say, PowerPoint or Visual Studio Code or Eclipse, Right? Uh, those programs typically read and write files, they ask for memory, they do a bunch of stuff, right? they draw stuff to the screen, and so on and so forth. How do those programs do it? Well, they, the, they actually ask the operating system for a lot of that stuff. And the operating system is the thing that knows how to talk to the hardware and do things like, how do I get memory? Right? Or how do I open a file? How do I write a file? And things like that. Right? As a user, you're typically up here and you typically interact with an application um, right here. Right? You're still going to be interacting with an application, but this application is going to be a lot closer to the operating system uh, than you would normally do in your everyday life. Right? So in particular, what you normally, or I guess most of you, when you use a computer, you use the mouse and the keyboard, you point and click at stuff, and so on and so forth. Right? So there's a graphical user interface. Right? Uh, before, there were these pretty graphical user interfaces. All you would get is something that looks like this. That, right? You would get, uh, oh, sorry, hang on. Let me see if I can make this bigger. Somehow I can adjust the, there we go. Okay, so you would get this window, right? Basically, uh, so how long ago now? 19, uh, I guess before the 80s. Uh, maybe during the 80s as well. If you were to sit down at a computer, this is all you'd see, right? You'd have a screen, if you were lucky. Uh, you'll see what I mean by that in the next lecture, right? That screen would just have a blinking cursor and text, right? And you would interact with the operating system via the console, right? So you type something in, press enter, and something happens, right? And so this is the type of interaction that you're going to be using um, for the uh, first part of this course, right? That program that's right there, that's called the terminal. The software that's running in the terminal is called the shell, and that shell is called bash, right? And so I've got a bash shell here, that is when I can type stuff into the terminal, so when I type something like cat start here, right, uh, and press enter, the shell will look at what I typed in, it'll try to interpret that as some command, and then it'll execute that command. Right? And so in this case, uh, cat will um, uh, output, well, pr I guess the, for now, cat will print the contents of a file to the terminal. It actually does something else, but I'll explain what it does later. Right? And so you can see that the contents of this file, well, there's a bunch of stuff in it, right? Um, if you're curious about this, this is the language that your notebooks are written in, right? Uh, so this is the uh, language of Jupyter Notebooks, right? And so we're going to be, inter you're go you are going to be interacting with your operating system in this fashion, uh, at least for the first uh, five or so weeks of the course. Do -do -do -do. All right, so... Right, so most of this course involves using a command line interface to interact with uh, an operating system called Linux. Right? Now, what is Linux, or what is GNU Linux? If you click that link, it'll take you to a short article on a web page that tells you the history of Linux. Right? So uh, I'm not going to go through it right now. I have it up, but I'm not going to go through it right now. It's all just a big wall of text. Right? Uh, in brief, though, uh, Linux is a free, right? free as in beer, open source, uh, meaning anybody can look at the source code, right? It's an operating system, right? It's widely used, although it's not widely used by most uh, people, right? Or at least most people don't know that they're using uh, Linux, right? So where it's most commonly used um, is in infrastructure, right? So the servers uh, that operate the, uh, the network that we use every day, right? The vast majority of those are Linux servers. Right, mainframes, 
which you probably don't know are. Mainframes are these big, big computers uh, that large institutions use, typically banking institutions. Um, supercomputers, these are uh, computers that are used by scientists to perform uh, scientific uh, computations. Uh, and embedded devices, so these are the uh, typically inexpensive computing devices that you don't actually know are computers, right? So like your modem or your router for your internet, probably running, well, there's a good chance it's running Linux, right, uh, inside that box, right? Uh, your automobile, your car, a typical modern car probably has about 100 computers in it. They're all running some variation of some operating system. Probably not Linux. They're probably running some custom uh, operating system, right? Uh, but your car has got dozens or hundreds of computers in it. Uh, and those are all embedded computers, right? They don't have a monitor, there's no keyboard, right? There's no easy way for you to interact with it, right? Those are all called embedded devices. All right, so when people talk about Linux, they typically mean uh, what's more properly called the GNU Linux operating system. I'll explain that next lecture. Okay, now, if we're using Linux in this course, you obviously have a problem because most of you are probably not using Linux. Is anybody actually using Linux? Okay, so like two of you, right? Three? Okay, so good for you, right? Uh, that's awesome. If you're using Linux on your desktop, you're set. You don't, you're good to go, right? You can install some of the software that, uh, that I'm using in the course. Instructions, you'll be able to figure out by looking at the Windows instructions. Uh, and you'll get the notebooks working and everything, right? You'll be, you'll be good to go. Now, everybody else is probably using Windows and Mac. Who's using Mac? So about a third, half maybe. Yeah, that's good, okay. Good, uh, good news for you, if you're using Mac, you're also almost more or less, so you're more or less ready to go, right? Mac is actually a variation of Unix. Linux is also a variation of Unix. So many of the tools that Linux has, uh, your Mac computer already has. You have to install some software, but I've got a handy dandy web page all set up for you uh, where you can follow the instructions. So if you go to content, uh, but, but uh, course readings and resources. There's a getting started page. If you're on Mac, uh, where's Mac? Just click the Mac OS users uh, and click that link there. And there's a set of instructions for you to install everything you need for this course. Hopefully I fix, oh, there's something missing. A spell's missing, but that's not a big, it's, that's not important. Okay, so if you're on Mac, pretty easy to set up. Uh, if you're on Windows, it's also pretty easy to set up now that Microsoft has the, uh, what's called the Windows subsystem for Linux. So that is the, if you're a Windows user uh, and you insist on using your home computer, this is the recommended way uh, to uh, get Linux on your machine, right? You work, you're still in Windows, Linux basically behaves as though it was just a regular, a normal application, right? So for example, that uh, window I had up here, that is Linux running in the win uh, Linux running in Windows, right? So this is Ubuntu uh, running in Windows. Okay, so if you install this software here, following those instructions, the second link, there's quite a bit of typing you have to do to install a bunch of software, right? Just follow the instructions. Just take your time, follow the instructions carefully. Everything should be fine. If you can't get it working, come see me during office hours. I'll help you get started, right? It's not a big deal. Uh, but you should be able to, uh, if you have a even reasonably modern computer, you should be able to get uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux running. If you have Windows 11, it's a little easier than Windows 10. Um, but Windows 10 is fine. As long as you don't have an ancient computer, uh, you should be fine. Laptop's fine, desktop's fine, whatever you have, right? Um, I guess a Chromebook is not fine. If anybody's using a Chromebook, you're gonna have problems, right? Uh, don't you, uh, so you have, to you have to either acquire another computer or you have another option. Uh, where is it? Cast Lab, right? So the department has a small number of Linux, well, Linux and Windows computers. You can dual boot them. Um, called Cast Lab. Uh, do you guys know about Cast Lab? Yes? Okay, so if you know about Cast Lab, that's great. Get yourself, an, uh, you probably have an account. You probably know how to use the uh, computers that are there already. Right, uh, they have, uh, those are all, if you boot them into Linux, they're all Linux operating systems. What are they? There's some derivative of Ubuntu. Um, they have Bash installed already for you and all of the compiler tools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They don't have the course notes. So if you want the course notes, 
uh, you have uh, some options, right? So your options for the course notes. So if you follow the instructions that I just showed you on OnQ, like here, there is a section here that says how to install the notes, right? Uh, hopefully they work for you. Uh, there's some students do have problems, especially in Windows, getting them to work all the time. Um, so if you do have problems getting the notes to work on your computer, uh, I actually managed to get them working uh, on the internet. So it, there's a link to my GitHub page for this course. There's also a link here. Uh, this is also on OnQ. If you follow that link, and uh, you give it a second to fire up. So I'm just gonna keep on talking while this starts up. It takes a little while to start up. You'll be able to access the notes online. Uh, oh, actually it didn't take too long. Okay, so here are the notes. Uh, just let me get this stuff out of the way. It's hard to use the notes to lecture to because, uh, to lecture with because uh, they're not really meant to be projected on a screen. They're meant to be uh, viewed on a computer uh, monitor. Right? So all of the notes are here. Right? Each one of these links takes you to a uh, Jupyter notebook. Right? So for example, introduction of the Now the thing is, so this, this, all this stuff is running on someone's server somewhere in the world. I don't know where. Um, someone's running it for free for me, which is nice. Um, so on their server, they're serving up this web page. Embedded in this web page are a bunch of these little cells like this. Right? If you saw, if you took 124 with me and you looked at the notes in 124, it's all the same thing. Except now you've got bash running in, uh, you've got bash cells running in your browser, which is kind of cool uh, if you actually think about it. So there's a bash command. So if I press control and enter, it'll actually run that command. You can also, there's a run button up here somewhere, but I got rid of it, so, right? Uh, and so the notes are completely interactive, right? So I can go into that cell. Remember, this is running on someone else's computer, right? It's not running on my computer right now. And I can go and change what was typed in, right? Uh, so goodbye world, oops, and run that, right? And that runs the bash command called echo to print out a, a, tech, uh, a line of text. There's this command called ls, right? Uh, so ls is a command that you're gonna be using quite a lot in this course. So the ls command uh, will list all the files uh, that are in your current directory, right? So if I run that, notice that it spits back a bunch of stuff, right? It says there's uh, roughly, I don't know, what, 20, 30, 40 files in this directory, right? Those are actually all, all of your bash notebook files. Right? Now, on your if you install the notes on your computer, you actually get access to all of the source code for this stuff. Can you actually read that at the back? Are you okay reading that at the back? I know it's black on, it's something on black. It might be hard to read. All right, so in the notes directory, oh, sorry, there's this. So we're actually in the bash directory at this point in time. So I can switch into the bash directory and list the contents there, right? So when you run ls in that Jupyter notebook, What's actually happening is on someone's server somewhere in the world, you're currently in this directory and when you list the contents of that directory, you're listing the contents of that directory that's right there, right? So if you get the notes onto your computer, uh, you can hopefully look at them on your computer. Uh, and even if you can't look at them, you have access to all the source code because in that directory called scripts, you'll find a bunch of other directories. Inside each one of those directories are the scripts corresponding to any given notebook, right? So inside the directory called the uh, introduction to bash scripting, you'll find any of the scripts that are used in the current notebook that I'm showing you. Right? So let's just keep on chugging through this notebook. Right? So ls, that's the command that lists the contents of a directory. Right? Cat, which I showed you very quickly a second ago. Uh, so cat is a file, it's, so it's a command uh, that concatenates files, so joins files together, right? Or more precisely, joins the contents of files together, right? So I can take two files and cat them together to produce one uh, new file, right? Now by default, cat prints stuff to the terminal, right? So if I take the cat command, and pass it this file called animals.txt, right? 
cat will concatenate animals.txt with the empty string and give you back the resulting string. Right? So you get back the string. In this case, cat, zebra, dog, and armadillo. Right? If you go into your, if you happen to have access to the notes, right, you can go into uh, your introduction to VAST scripting directory and you'll find that there's a, oh, I lie, never mind, sorry. I went too far. If you just stay in your uh, bash uh, directory, right, you'll see that there's a file called animals.txt. Right? So that's the contents of the file that are being printed when I type cat. Right? So cat animals.txt, and lo and behold, right, it's four lines of text. Okay, cat fruit. So there's another file called fruit.txt, right? So if I cat that, it's gonna print out, whoa, sorry, there's not a file called fruit. Is there no fruit? There's no, oh, fruits, okay. First bug in the notebook. Uh, I could lie and tell you this was intentional, but it, it wasn't, right? So fruits, you can fix it on the notebook, right? Press enter and there you go, right? So strawberry, mango, pineapple, and apple, right? Now I can, cat is supposed to concatenate the, two, con the contents of two files, right? So if I give them both files, right? Cat joins the two files, right? Or joins the contents of the two files, right? So you get the animals followed by the fruits, right? Uh, and there's a way to take that text and store it into another file. And I'll show you that later on in the course. There's another handy command called sort, right? So sort uh, will take the contents of a file and sort it line by line, right? So it takes each line of the file, treats each line as though it was a single string, and then tries to sort the contents of the file. You can ask it to sort in reverse or in forward order, right? So if I sort the animals, you get them out in alphabetic order, right? Armadillo through zebra, right? Again, if you go back and look at the contents of animals, sorry, animals.txt, right? They're in a different order, right? The original order is cat, zebra, dog, armadillo, right? So they're not sorted. If I sort them, right, I get the uh, contents of the file sorted line by line. Okay, now, uh, what bash is really meant to do? Uh, bash is meant to take, so Linux has a, well, your op Linux, Unix, whatever, your operating system has lots and lots and lots of commands. I think somewhere at the top I tell you how many are on this computer. Yes, right there, right? So on my computer when I wrote this notebook, there's something like 4,500 commands installed on my computer, right, or in Linux on my computer, right? Uh, do I actually know what all those commands are? No. In fact, I probably only know maybe a few dozen, right? I don't know all 4,500, but there's lots, right? What bash is meant to do is it's meant to uh, use these commands. Bash is meant to take these commands, maybe arrange them in certain orders, take the output of one command, send it to another command, and so on and so on and so forth, right? So it's a scripting language or a glue language, right? You take, you've got lots and lots of tools and you hook them up together. Right? That's really what bash is meant, uh, uh, the bash, the scripting language, is meant to do. Right? So, for example, I can take my two files, animals and fruit, right? I can concatenate them together, right? And that produces that, right? But then maybe I want that sorted, right? So I can take the output of cat and then I can send it to sort. Right? Uh, you use that little bar there. So that bar is what's called a pipe. Right? So I can take the output of cat, send that to the input of sort, and lo and behold, you can get the sorted list of animals and fruit. Right? So there's two simple commands joined together using a pipe and bash. Right? We're gonna talk more about this uh, in greater detail later on. Okay. So what you're gonna learn very quickly in this course is that in Linux or in Unix, uh, your files, a lot of them are text, right? They contain text. Um, and so a lot of the tools in uh, Unix, Linux, whatever, right? Uh, are designed to operate on text, right? So there's a command called grep that will search a file for a pattern, right? The pattern is specified what's called a regular expression, 
we'll talk about regular expressions later in the course. Right? I've got this file called animals.txt. I might want to know, hey, what are all the animals that start with the letter A? Right? And so I can use grep to answer that question. Right? So grep mm, caret A, so the, up, the triangle is called the caret, shift six right, on your keyboard. Right? Uh, so grep caret A, animals.txt, asks grep to search for all lines in animals.txt, not all lines, all the text in animals.txt for words that start with the letter A. There's only one, right, armadillo. Right. Maybe I want to find all words that have a P in them, right? I can ask grep to look for all words that contain a P in fruits.txt, right? So you see pineapple and apple, those are the two words that have a P in them, right? And you can use um, much more complicated regular expressions to do things like extract all of the email addresses out of a file or extract all the student numbers out of a file or whatever. Right? Whatever you can describe using this thing called a regular expression. OK, so what other commands are there? Well, there's 4,500 commands on my computer. So we can go on for hours and hours and hours and hours, right? Um, here's an example of something that might be useful. I might want to know what the date is, right? Now, remember back in the day when all you had to look at was this, right? Uh, you know, it, it would be handy if there was a way to find out what is the actual time. The date command, whoa, not the dart command. The date command does just that, right? So date tells me that it's currently Monday, January the 9th at 2.07 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2023. Right? Now, is that all it tells me? No, that's not all it will tell you. Nope, sorry. Did I close it? Where'd it go? Here. Uh, no, sorry, here. Okay, now. Almost every command that you use uh, will have options that you can specify to the command. Right? Options change the way the command behaves. This is one of the difficult parts with using a command line interface. Right? You don't just have commands, 4,500 of them. Each command may have one, two, or hundreds of different options. Right? Uh, literally hundreds or thousands uh, of options, depending on the complexity of the program. Right? Uh, so date has an option called minus i, date, right? What does this do? I'm not sure what it does. Well, apparently it just prints out the date uh, in a numeric format, right? So the year, month, and day, right? It has lots of other options as well, right? Cal is a program uh, that prints a calendar. Whoop, right? So I type cal into my terminal, I can get the calendar for the current month. Right? Might be handy, especially if the only thing I'm looking at is a black terminal that just got text in it. Right? Obviously much less handy now that I've got something like this. Right? But back in the day, when all you had was a terminal to look at, this was a very useful program. Right? Like date, Cal has a bunch of options. Right? <coughs> so I can ask calendar for, month, for the uh, month number one, which is January, right? or month number 10 which is October, right, and so on and so forth. You can ask for the entire year if you want. Uh, this turns out to be surprisingly useful when you're planning out a course, right? So if I want to know when our assignments do or things like that, right, I can use, I can just print that out and then eyeball which week's assignments and tests and things should be due, right? Surprisingly hard to find something like this um, on the internet anywhere, right? You get lots and lots and lots of different calendars, none of them really do what you want it to do. Okay, so let's look at some stupid stuff now. Uh, so there's a, uh, there's a program called Fortune that you can install. It's not installed on your, on, it's not normally installed by default on most Linux distributions. It's not installed by default on Mac. Right, so you have to uh, follow the instructions on the course webpage if you want to install this program. If you don't, don't worry about it because you're not gonna use this for any assignments. Right? Fortune prints out a random fortune. So basically it's got this uh, book, I guess, or a file containing a whole bunch of random uh, fortunes in it, sayings, whatever you want to call them, and it just picks one out at random and prints it. Right? Uh, so this time it said you will give someone a piece of your mind, <laughs> which you can ill afford. Right? Uh, and there's lots of quotes in it, so there's Shakespeare, 
right? Run it again, you'll get something else. You've been leading a dog's life, stay off the furniture, and so on and so forth, right? So it just prints out a bunch of random stuff. Uh, and you can, uh, again, fortune like any other Linux command has a whole bunch of options in it. You can tell it from which file to read the fortunes from. You can ask it for uh, naughty fortunes, I guess. Uh, so there are some that are completely inappropriate for showing in a classroom. Um, you can ask it for those if you want, and so on and so forth, right? There are tons of options to all these commands. Okay, there's another program called Cowsay. Um, again, not standard. Follow the course instructions to install it if you want to see it. Right? Cow say prints a cow, and then it's got a bubble, and it has the whatever you uh, ask the cow to say. Right? So I can take fortune, the output of fortune, and send it to cow say, and have a cow say your fortune. Right? So you love peace. Right? Or you'll be a winner today, pick a fight with a four-year-old, right? or something like that. Right? Cow say has lots of options. You can change the animal or the shape that's printed uh, to print the cow. Um, there's a variation called cow think. Oh, this was in, uh, is this the, this one might not work because it's, yeah, that one doesn't work um, because of reasons. But I can run it here. Fortune and send the output of fortune to cow think. Right? Cow think is the same as cow th uh, say, but it uses a different box to print the, uh, the saying. What is the burning question on the mind of every dyslexic? And is there, oh, of every de dyslexic existentialist. Is there a <laughs> All right, so anyway, um, one of these days I'm gonna get in trouble using this, but anyway, that's not today. Okay, last example. There's a program called Toilet. Uh, toilet stands for the other implementation's letters, right? And it's a variation of this program called Figlet which is Frank, Ian, and Glenn's letters. You're gonna notice that when you're using Linux, uh, it's very easy to find software written by uh, people who have more time on their hands than they should, right? This is one of those examples, right? So, Toilet is a program that will take a string and print each letter of the string uh, with using ASCII art. So, for example, I can take Fortune, send its output to Toilet, and Toilet prints it out in these big letters. Was it saying elves and dragon? Oh, I can't read it. Uh, let's try it here. So fortune, send it to toilet. Oh, you probably can't read it here either. Don't hate yourself in the morning, sleep till noon. Perfect, right? Uh, and lots, you can find lots and lots and lots of other stupid Linux things. What is a SL? Steam locomotive? <laughs> Someone spent time writing this, right? Why did they write this? One of the most common commands in Linux is ls, right? List the contents of a directory. What's very easy to do? Say sl instead of ls. Someone decided this would be worthwhile doing. This is also not installed on most of your systems by default. You have to install it separately. Uh, anybody like the matrix? You can have the matrix on your console, right? That's a program called C-Matrix that you can install as well. That one doesn't run in the Jupyter Notebooks uh, because it's, so the fact that you can do this in a console is actually pretty impressive. Um, and that goes beyond the capabilities of the Jupyter Notebooks. So if you try to run um, some of these programs in the Jupyter Notebooks, they won't work, right? Uh, but all of the simple text-based stuff is probably fine. Okay, so I've talked enough for today. Uh, next class, we'll talk a little bit about the history of Linux um, and the Linux file system. Any questions before you leave? Okay. Oh.